Okay, it is now my distinct pleasure to introduce today's final keynote speaker, Major General Lorna Maylock. Major General Maylock currently serves as the Deputy Director of Cybersecurity for Combat Support at the National Security Agency. On a personal note, I'll tell you that I first had the opportunity to work with Lorna when she was serving in her previous position as the Director of Command, Control, Communications, and Computers and the Deputy Department of the Navy Chief Information Officer of the U.S. Marine Corps. I was always struck by her ability to zero in on the underlying and foundational problems associated with any big issue. And then, with brevity and clarity, not a skill many actually have, lay out approaches to make improvements and find solutions. Lorna was someone I knew we wanted at the fort, and by that I mean Fort Meade, and so I was thrilled when the Director General Nakasone was able to fight off all the other interested parties within the Department of Defense, and there were many, to bring this very talented officer up to Fort Meade. Not surprisingly, Lorna made an immediate impact in the Cybersecurity Directorate and has an incredibly bright future ahead of her continuing to serve our nation. This afternoon, Mid General Maylock's address is entitled Fighting with Bad Math, Implications for Cybersecurity at the Tactical Edge. Please join me in welcoming Major General Lorna Maylock to the stage. Thanks, sir. I appreciate that setup. I don't think I'll be able to live up to the, the hype, but first of all, I know that I'm between happy hour, Janet Jackson, and your prep for Taylor Swift, and I hear Oprah's in town. So, you know, tall order. But first of all, let me just say thanks to the Chancellor and the Vanderbilt team who set this thing up. Um, it really, really is an honor for me to be here at this event. I think it's also appropriate to say happy 150th anniversary to Vanderbilt. These days, that's a long time to be in business, right? Um, uh, because uh, this school has maintained such high standards, and I think that's why uh, your students and your alumni hold Vanderbilt in such high regard. I'm also grateful for the opportunity to be in the Music City. This is my first time here, right, uh, to participate in this year's summit, and so as we collaborate on these topics of significant importance to uh, national security, our people, our communities, our allies, and our way of life. In an era of competition among great, partner, among great powers, it is becoming increasingly apparent that cybersecurity has both national security and personal security implications. And so we're very appreciative for your thought leadership in this space. So before I dive into the details of the talk, I want to provide a little bit about my background and why I'm so passionate about this discussion about fighting with bad math at the tactical edge and what it means. Decades ago, at the end of the Cold War, as a new immigrant to the United States, I enlisted in the Marine Corps after being here for three months. My mom gave me some very clear guidance, get a job or go to college. And so in my young mind back then, I thought I'd outwitted my mom when I chose high adventure as a field radio operator in the Marine Corps, who were at the time looking for a few good men. They got me, right? But I was really, really excited to be a part of this community, this war fighting force, force who's focused on being most ready when the nation was least ready, right? And so the, operate, the ability to work with our nation's finest young men and women was really, really motivating. And the other thing for a 17-year-old, Look at the uniform. Pretty nice, right? So, um, so, so look at how it turned out. I think my mom probably got the last you know, word, right? She was right. I actually did go to college, but I don't think I got a job because this stuff is too rewarding to be called work. Um, and so, like uh, General Moore said, I've spent a, a career in Marine Aviation Command and Control as an air traffic controller. Uh, doing command and control with Stinger units, air defense units, uh, and like many more, like many of our service members, a couple of tours in the far and Middle East and Europe. Um, I've, I've spent some time at the Pentagon, and a lot of people don't like the Pentagon, but if you're going to influence you know, uh, the future, you have to work in the Pentagon because that's a resource conversation and that's a policy conversation, and you need to be in it. And so... Um, 
You know, as I worked, uh, as General Moore said, uh, as, the, as the CIO for the Marine Corps and the C4, what really resonated with me was the, the responsibility to deliver secure capabilities to our warfighting Marines that were globally deployed inside weapons engagement zones. And that is why it's so important to understand at the basic level what we're talking about in the cybersecurity space. And it really is about math. Um, and so I'm the current first and, and uh, current military deputy director for the cybersecurity directorate at the National Security Agency. I work for General Nakasone, and you'll hear from him tomorrow, and Rob Joyce, who you, you heard mentioned uh, today by uh, uh, Chris Krebs. Um, at the agency, we have two missions. One, all right, the first one is foreign signal intelligence, SIGINT, and the second one is cybersecurity. The cybersecurity directorate is about three years young. We're approximately 37 or 100 or so people, uh, roughly about 3,100 uh, civilian patriots, right? I have never worked with a more committed and dedicated uh, uh, patriotic group of folks than I do today at the National Security Agency. And the Marines are pretty darn patriotic, and so is the Department of Defense. We've got about 650 or so military members, and I'm very, very proud to be one of them. So at CSD, we employ what we call a startup mentality, primarily focused on how we leverage what we learn from foreign intelligence to give our nation a strategic advantage in the cybersecurity space. So we make the codes that underpin the national security systems. For example, when you think about our weapons and space systems, you think about the nuclear command and control, the football that the, the president carries to make those uh, uh, nuclear, um, those, those command and control calls, we make the code that underpins that. And so our team at the Cybersecurity Directorate, they apply <clears throat> largely hackers, right? But what they do is they apply their deep computer network exploitation expertise. Uh, and our remit is to prevent and eradicate threats to US national security systems. And so the team uses an offensive mindset to inform how we protect and defect, uh, to protect and defend our nation's critical infrastructure, weapons in space, and C2 systems. And so what the team usually says uh, because we have, um, you know, really a balanced approach of using hackers. Uh, they say it, it takes a thief to catch a thief, right? And uh, they're very, very effective at it. And so why do you see me like really, really fired up about working at the National Security Agency and the Cybersecurity Directorate uh, particularly? Because we get to work with some of the nation's finest people on the hardest problems. We see China, Russia, Iran, uh, North Korea and non-state actors like ransomware groups are becoming more and more pernicious in their desire to exploit us. They exploit weakness, our weakness during competition to gain access to our financial and legal systems and our critical infrastructure during um, competition. They penetrate critical infrastructure like water, rail, power, um, and, uh, and aviation. Uh, with the objective to create panic among our citizenry. From a military perspective, their objective is to make sure we never leave our bases, posts, and station. Um, they want to deny our ability to act decisively in a global crisis and contingency. And so China has a global reach. You've heard that today. They have a global SIGIN system. And so there is a change in paradigm for us as warfighters. What we have learned is that our pre-existing paradigm of what constituted the tactical edge has shifted, and it hasn't been subtle. And so the tactical edge in an era of technology conversions and what some calls disruptive or enduring disorder has shifted to expand to include industry, academia, the defense industrial base, the folks who make our critical capabilities that we fight with. So this evening, I'm gonna cover a couple of topics. I'm gonna to have a couple of requests for assistance. The first topic centers on this idea of what I call bad math. And it's not only a problem for our warfighters, it's also a problem for our nation. 
It's what I call that expired math, which is the obsolete ones and zeros that were originally, uh, uh, they were originally uh, intended to protect our, protect our data and our networks, uh, which now manifest in exploitable code and then our obsolete encryption and why cybersecurity matters for our warfighters at the tactical edge. We'll talk about what we're doing about it, right? And that is really, really a good conversation because what you will not find is us curled up in the corner in a fetal position with an abacus. That's just not our nature, right? We're getting after it, but it's gonna take all of us. It's gonna take all hands on deck. And finally, I'll close with a thought, some thoughts on how, you're, how we can uh, leverage your assistance. At the end of our session today, you'll find that cyber, the cybersecurity terrain will have changed drastically. New zero days, new technologies, and many of our war fighting and weapon systems, however, were built yesteryear, right? They were not envisioned to operate in today's contested and congested cyber and electronic warfare space. This creates a target-rich environment for our adversaries um, and also uh, nation-state actors at the tactical edge. I'll apologize up front for those who came to the talk because uh, there was a notion that we was going to talk about encryption. This talk is about the other E. It's about the edge and why encryption matters at the tactical edge. And so why am I talking about good math? Well, because at the National Security Agency, we have some of the best mathematicians. Um, and I've, I love engaging with them. I always feel smarter when I get done talking with them. Not really. Um, so seriously. So at the end, let me just share with you, at the end of, at the beginning of my assignment at NSA, after a lengthy conversation one day uh, with a, um, where I was channeling a, uh, a user of a tactical system that had obsolete encryption, and I was trying to make the argument about why we should use the capability just a little bit longer. I had one of our mathematicians say to me, he goes, General, let me just make, break this down for you very simply. The math in that system was designed 20 years ago. It's bad. The adversary is going to eat your lunch if you use that math. You don't want to go to war with bad math. And I was like, well, I actually understood that. Right? Why didn't you say that two hours ago? Or maybe two years ago, <laughs> right? As we've been having this conversation um, about cybersecurity in the department. But simply put, right, it really is about readiness for us. The encryption that we use in all these systems that underpin cybersecurity, it really is about ensuring that um, the adversary doesn't uh, exploit these systems. So what is the edge? I mean, because edge means a lot of things to a lot of people. In the military parlance, the tactical edge, historically, not just for US, but also our Western allies, the edge has historically been over there, right? When you think about Afghanistan, Iraq, Vietnam, it's been where we close with and destroy the enemy with fires uh, and close combat and maneuver, right? Uh, it wasn't over here. And so, as I mentioned, I spent a, a career in aviation, seven years in the Indo-PACOM AOR, where we deployed with Aviation C2 systems and radars with impunity, with allies and partners, all under the watchful eye of China, really not understanding the implications of some of the things that we were doing. And I was reading a J Japan Times article recently, and the headlines blared, an anxious Asia arms for war it hopes to prevent, right? And the article focused on an, a, a pilot on, on the island of Tinian as he, you know, um, uh, preps his airplane and Japan's buildup and changes in their policy and their laws, et cetera, as they pr uh, prepare themselves for a, the growing power that is China. And so the reference to Tinian made me think about my own experiences there. And I'll, I'll tell you, a number of years ago, during my own visit to a small island, 39 or so square miles, 3,000 people in the middle of the Pacific, which was significant during World War II, it, was very, it is a very austere environment. That really was the tactical edge for us. Forward deployed, tip of the spear. And after landing at a small airstrip, you know, the we hiked up to this site. And the, de the, de the de detachment commander 
was so excited about his site. Um, frankly, his camouflage and, and concealment was awesome. You could barely find them in the middle of the jungle, right? And so um, uh, later, I had the opportunity to tour the island with the mayor and his team. And we were able to see the artifacts of China on the island, right? The hotels that were the exclusive domain of China, the casinos, et cetera. But what was really, you know, as I reflect back on that experience, the staffer was really excited about our partnership. He's like, ma'am, look, we were able to source, you know, local network cables and routers and Wi-Fi pucks that you guys forgot at home. Um, we were able to, you know, set up morale lines and we used local telecom providers. This was really, really good partnering. And we didn't give it a second thought back then, right? But today, I mean, our, our mindset back then was what happens on deployment stays on deployment. What happens at the edge stays on the edge. This is a new day. We don't think that way anymore. We understand um, that, you know, the edge is really broader than we originally thought. And so today the new reality for us is the technologies are more complex. There are few closed, small, closed networks on small islands. Uh, the edge for our warfighters really begin the begins the minute those warfighting capabilities are envisioned. And so whether it was conceived, conceived in the defense industrial base, in academia, at our national labs, uh, or with our business and industry partners. And so if you've had the opportunity to read the Microsoft uh, report on defending Ukraine early lessons from cyber war, last year's report, or this year's report that said, uh, the title is a year in, uh, of Russia hybrid war in Ukraine, they underscore this idea that the tactical edge no longer is about four deployed with troops in contact. Our adversary knows that this is, they employ, and they will have to employ a whole of nation and whole of government approach. And you heard that earlier from our keynote speaker, right? They use every instrument of national power in order to, and influence, not only cyber, but influence to destroy a people and a nation. And we have to be postured to be able to uh, persist in that environment. We also understand for the, from the Ukrainian cybersecurity uh, department that Ukraine, Ukraine sustained more than 2,000 cyber attacks last year. 300 plus of those attacks were against defense and security sectors. Approximately 400 or so of those attacks targeted groups impacting civilian infrastructure, commercial industry, energy, finance, telecommunications, and software. Uh, Ukrainian officials state that more than, they, they experience more than 10 cyber attacks per day. But we're also seeing in the same conflict, what we're also seeing there is that the Ukrainians also have an advantage, which can be attributed to their cybersecurity defensive posture. They hardened their systems, they updated their encryption, and they focused on the basics. This enabled both tactical, operational and strategic deterrence, right, and resilience. And that is something we have yet to truly quantify. And so today our adversary's intent is to ensure we never leave our bases and station. Um, they have a global SIGINT system, right, and they know how to use it. And so as I reflect back on my time on that island and the change in the paradigm that we're seeing right now, it is with this idea that as we think about our intelligence prep of the battle space to determine our, our readiness, our operational readiness and our risk to maneuver. It is to be able to think about the adversary driven by an intelligence construct that, construct that tells us that that seemingly uh, innocuous Wi-Fi connection at the airfield or the tactical site creates a ton of opportunities for the adversary. We also know that the signals and data emanating from our sensors now and our weapon systems can be decrypted, that our platforms that employ uh, poor or obsolete encryption are access vectors for our adversary. And local vendors and telecom, we have to understand, our warfighters now know, we have to understand how that data traverses, you know, that local telecom. And finally, you know, for our new weapons capabilities that are developed, we have to understand that there may be an advanced persistent threat because of the threat to the DIB. In the Marine Corps, we say every Marine is a rifleman. In this new arena for warfighters, we are seeing an evolution where every warfighter must be a cybersecurity sentry. And so um, 
So why does this matter? Why does math matter? If you don't want, we say, if you don't want your adversary to know it, control it, or deny your use of it, then strong, uh, unbreakable encryption is your first and last line of defense. And it's simply about math. And so for a warfighter, the conversation for us is no longer about cyber hygiene at the tactical edge. Hygiene is a relative thing for a warfighter forward deployed, right? I know, I'm a Marine. They can go for a long time when you're forward deployed uh, when it comes to hygiene, so it's relative. Uh, and so for our conversation at the edge, the discussion about hygiene has pivoted to readiness. It's about cyber readiness. And so that underpins everything that we do. And in our mind, in our parlance now, the idea that our warfighting systems are not truly ready unless they're cyber ready to be operationally ready. And so as we think of cybersecurity uh, readiness at the edge, it has a mathematical component, and you heard that touched on briefly today. It's the resourcing decision, right? And so when you think of an aircraft, uh, depending on the pedigree of the fighter, it could cost upward of $100 million or so per copy. Uh, a, a, a submarine may cost about $2 billion per copy. And, and so some of our systems, again, should have been decommissioned years ago, and they weren't envisioned to persist in this environment. It's always fascinating as a CIO to have these conversations about um, math. And at, at, a heavy, at a very high level, I recall having a conversation where, uh, where a very, very cogent argument laid out about why the resources were not going to be uh, um, assigned to, to fix the vulnerability that was really critical for one of our weapons and space system. And so um, one of our hackers got really frustrated in this high-level conversation and said, hey, look, if you look at this, a airplane is a computer that flies. A submarine is a computer underwater. And a satellite is a computer in the air. Give me poor encryption, poor math, and a little bit of time, and I will hack your kill chain. And so obsolete math is costly. And in our business, it can be deadly, but we get the imperative. And that was another lesson I learned at NSA. It's about the frag fragility of our kill chain. So what are we doing about it, right? So we're doing a number of things. The department gets the imperative, and we see the solution um, in uh, the US government, and in, in our work with partners, in our work with policy, and our people. And so that's another reason why I'm really excited about the work that we're doing at the Cybersecurity Directorate in, in that we take what we know from threat intelligence and we are able to provide resource and intelligence-informed uh, solutions to the threat we, we face to senior leaders. Uh, and we get the imperative and we're driving outcomes along three lines of effort. Uh, we know that yesteryear's supercomputer is today's lab, laptop. And so our three priority areas are first, modernize your encryption uh, and posture for quantum. The second is eliminate vulnerabilities in our weapons and our critical, most critical networks in our weapons and space systems. Um, and our third is protect the defense industrial base. And so you'll hear national security agency representatives talk about the reauthorization of our most important foreign intelligence, one of our most important foreign intelligence authorities, and that's Section 702 of the FISA Amendment Act. This is a critical enabler for cybersecurity, uh, cybersecurity of our nation's warfighters. The mechanism that it provides enables us to use the foreign signal intelligence that we gain to feed cybersecurity threats, uh, and this authority aids in our ability to identify and take down uh, ransomware actors and criminal cyber groups while protecting our nation and our citizens. So in concert with partners, we see cybersecurity as the ultimate team sport. We work with Cybercom in order to have unity of effort to be able to get after uh, the threat. We work with the interagency, strong partnerships with FBI, CISA, uh, and Homeland Defense and others. And I'll give you an exemplar. Uh, most recently of our, that strong partnership with CISA and others. Uh, during April of this month, uh, of this year, we worked with CISA and FBI and the UK to put out a cybersecurity advisory detailing um, APT28, a Russian GRU cyber um, actor exploiting Cisco uh, malware, uh, malware router, uh, 
Cisco routers uh, using malware. That's, Cisco is a key part of not only our military networks, but also our civilian networks. And so this has edge concern for the Department of Defense. Industry is also a great partner. We, also, we are finding that one of our most capable partners is industry. They have broad SIGINT apertures, just like we do, and they have a global reach. And so as we work with them, uh, and one of the things that we did at the National Security Agency was establish what we called the Cybersecurity Collaboration Center. And the Cybersecurity uh, Collaboration Center, their remit is to get left of threat of the threat and get left of theft uh, and to limit our concerns that we have at the tactical edge. We have to be proactive, vice reactive in this space. And so they're located outside the fence of NSA. They create public and private partnerships with the DIB ecosystem, which is critical for our warfighters at the tactical edge. As you think about the DIB, right, that um, organization, <laughs> it, it's, it, it's not a monolith, right? Uh, so what we un our understanding of the DIB keeps growing. Uh, and so from a, as, if, as we, if we were to try to characterize it, we think about the big 30 DIB companies. As we decompose that, we're learning that the DIB is also composed of 30,000 additional, uh, additional contractors. And as you decompose that further, we've got about 300,000 unique um, companies under a million dollars, small and bigs, that are part of that DIB. They all have uh, create opportunities and risks for us in the cybersecurity space. And so um, we've got uh, several examples of our work with the DIB, but most importantly, we have um, a really good example of most recently we worked with a, a, uh, a partner where, uh, where we realized that a, a Chinese APT was exploiting this partner uh, uh, network. Um, and so using SIGINT really, really quickly, we, we, um, we, we made that information available to the partner. And what we found is, as we shared with the partner, the partner was able to see that uh, activity in their enterprise. They also, we were also able to share broadly with other partners. We worked with that, um, that organization. We worked with CISA, FBI, and others. We were able to develop hunt guides, share that broadly. Um, and then as we, as we um, the company worked mitigations uh, to that vulnerability, we were able to share that broadly, not only inside the US, but also with our allies and partners. What we saw after we shared that broadly was um, an independent um, analysis agency came back and told us that post the deployment of our hunting guides, um, of our, um, uh, of the malware, of uh, the, the mitigation to that malware across uh, the US and with our allies, um, the use, uh, the APT activity went down by 25% globally. And so that is how we are going to def deter at scale. We see allies and partners as a critical part of this calculus. And as we raise the bar on their cybersecurity, it's really important for us uh, at the tactical edge. In policy, we've got in the policy space, we've gotten a lot of new policy um, uh, uh, from across the U.S. government enterprise. Uh, the president signed Executive Order 14028, which is about raising the cybersecurity across the enterprise. We've got National Security Memorandum 8, which is all about, you know, uh, giving us collectively the authorities to modernize cybersecurity uh, and reduce risk uh, across the U.S. ecosystem to adapt, uh, uh, modernize encryption, uh, enable zero trust. National Security Memorandum 10 tells us to get after quantum time now to be able to protect ourselves. We also have a DIB delegation authority. We also have a 1642B authorities, which enable us to be able to share uh, broadly with the DIB. But the 1642B delegation enables us to work with the DIB uh, on voluntary partnerships in, in, uh, between government and industry focus on threats from nation state actors like Russia, PRC, North Korea, and Iran. People are asymmetric advantage. We've had some of the best uh, people that work at the National Security Agency, but the workforce um, uh, is insuffic insufficient to meet global demands. We're hiring over 3,000 or so people this year, uh, and your students and the faculty, uh, you know, if you want a sabbatical, you too could be one of us. Um, <laughs> you know, we're always recruiting. Um, and so we've got to promote the great work that we're doing in government. And finally, 
It said that the future belongs to those who plan for it yesterday. And that's, I think, where we can use your help. And I think that's four key areas, right? It's in leadership. It's this forum, this continued thought leadership on you know, how we drive, how do we improve the people, the policies, and the partnerships to be able to get after and get left of the adversary. Uh, and it's also you know, how do we work uh, to develop a cadre of people to embrace this mission. And so this audience here and the students are the future of cybersecurity. And so we think whether you work in government, uh, industry, uh, or academia, we need more than a few good people to, to so help us solve these wicked hard problems. Um, and particularly, I mean, I know from a DOD perspective, you've heard, you know, the, the, the discussion around joint all domain command and control. We're really, really interested in your insights uh, in that perspective. Standards, China looks for places that they can influence standards. They outnumber us four to one on the standards body. And so we look to you to be able to help us in the standard space. And finally, the last panel ended with this. This idea of cybersecurity education. We need your help to think about how do we do cybersecurity readiness in our citizenry and so they can navigate. At the end of the day, how do we start at K through 12, right? It's, you know, how do we make um, our citizenry to build, how do we build in our citizenry the curriculum that makes this a, a mandatory requirement? understanding cybersecurity and, and influence operations. We've got a really good partnership with Vanderbilt in this space, but you know, what elementary schools do we partner with now? We're doing some activity at the National Security Agency centered around um, you know, uh, uh, the, the younger, not the high school level, but certainly the K through, uh, through six. Uh, at the end of the day, your military, our citizens, and our nations we can't, our nation, we can't re wait for crisis and conflict to implement good math and improve our cybersecurity readiness. We are fighting now for this democracy in competition. This is truly an infinite game. We need your help, and I believe the odds are in our favor if we do this together. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. That was fantastic. Uh, I know we do have time for a few questions. I've been pulling them off the, off the website, so appreciate you entertaining those. First one's pretty broad, but uh, b based on your talk, if, if you can narrow it down to one thing, what is the biggest concern you have as it relates to cybersecurity and the U.S. Department of Defense? Yeah, um, that's a really good question. I think um, it's the, the democrat democratization of the technology. Right, as you think about, um, for me, at the edge, I'm thinking, wow, what happens? You know, how do you, how do you respond to a ransomware at the tactical uh, edge, right? Um, the technology is so prolific, the barrier to entry is really, really low. And so our warfighters need to develop the, um, the resilience to be able to persist in that environment. Uh, the speed and scale of the adversary um, I think it's really insufficient for us to rely solely on the exquisite cyber force to be able to, to provide threat response. And so some of the things that are going on in the department, I think we should be really heartened um, by. Uh, we're, you know, if you think about Kessel Run and what that group is doing, a lot of the services are thinking about how do they do secure application development, because it's all about the data at the tactical edge. And even for my own service, I mean, a couple of years ago, uh, we were, this idea of, you know, doing software development at the tactical edge was an anathema. But now, what we know based on um, the, uh, the, the pernicious nature of the adversary and the speed and scale at which they can move, we have to be able to respond uh, to operate in contested and congested environment, but also fight through hurt. Uh, the other piece of that is, one, the low barrier to entry, the pernicious nation of the adversary, but also um, we have to be able to get in, inculcate inside the services and across the department to be able to maneuver based on intelligence. Mm -hmm. It's intelligence support to everything. Intelligence support to acquisition, right? Which is um, one of the things that, you know, uh, I think we're, we're getting the idea that, you know, these weapons and space systems that we have, our networks that we have, 
um, have to be able to persist. And we can't, you know, uh, putting that burden solely on the warfighter at the edge when we deliver capability uh, is insufficient going forward. And that's why you see the department getting, trying to get left of the theft, left of threat in our work that we're doing with the defense industrial base, but also the work that we, we talk about we're doing with partners. You know, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, you, you see uh, 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 the, the CISA team here, um, and, and that is so important because the work that we do on the homeland is critical for the work that we will do if we're given uh, the requirement to deploy, right? Um, it's, we know the cybersecurity actors out there are trying to get after our critical infrastructure, right? So if they take out you know, power, water, or air around a geolocation of a base that provides a, an exquisite capability, um, then we can't get there from here. They want to stop us before uh, we, we leave um, our assembly areas. And so the partnerships with CISA and others is, um, is so critical going forward. So we are grappling with how to modernize our future capabilities and how to secure our legacy systems. How do we balance those efforts and our adversaries dealing with the same issue that we are? Yeah, right. And so that's a complex challenge, right? Um, I think one of the things that we talked about is the, the power of partnerships, mm -hmm. right? Um, if everybody plays their lanes, there's just so much work to go around. And so if we, you know, if we think about how do we prioritize the work we need to do now against the adversary, and we collectively look at where we see in emerging technologies coming, um, uh, that, are, that are coming on the horizon, uh, and we collectively work and you know, stack our authorities and our resources to be able to get after the most important thing for our nation. If we act as a team, mm -hmm. I think we have sufficient resources, and if we prioritize, uh, we have sufficient resources and capability, both human capital and resources, to be able to, be able to persist. I think it's not just inside the US, United States, but the power of our partnerships, right? Whether it's our national partnerships or international partnerships, those are, are gonna enable us to get after it. Um, it's the work that we do with the defense industrial base um, and industry, because again, that's where um, the technologies, the capabilities that were used are conceived, mm -hmm. but also uh, if we help them with what we know in terms of adversaries' intent, then that also protect them. So to answer your question, I think, again, if, you know, we, we have to do both, mm -hmm. right? There is no way around that. But if we work together as a team, right, both nationally and internationally, to use our authorities to be able to stack those to deter the adversary now while we think strategically about the infinite game, the long game, much like, you know, our adversaries think about it, then I think we'll have, I think we'll have a, a fighting chance. And I, my bet is on us, because to your point earlier, um, there is no, um, I mean, I, I'm an immigrant to this, this great nation, and I've seen us come through some, you know, really trying times. And uh, there is no better intellectual capital um, than the people that we have in this, these great United States. So um, I think we can get after it, but again, it's, it's going to take all of us, and it's going to take us thinking about this in terms of where are we strongest, let them do that, mm -hmm. and then how do our authorities work together in order to drive a unified effort. And unity of command and unity of action and unity of effort is really the, the, the thing I think that will drive us forward. Great. I thought you would like this question. So what should we change about the training of future Marines based on your conversation earlier? Yeah, right. So um, the commandant is like really prescient on this, right? And so the whole force design uh, work that we've been doing inside the Marine Corps is how do we equip, equip Marines to operate persistently, consistently inside the weapons engagement zone uh, of, of, of China and also give the department an advantage. Uh, we're the first in force. And so from a cybersecurity perspective, um, I'll tell you, really proud of Mar4 Cyber uh, is a part of the cyber service cyber component in the work that they're doing. 
um, to, to one of the points I made earlier, we're thinking about, you know, uh, not only the cyber spectrum, but EW, how do we fight hurt uh, with the confluence of space, cyber and EW? How do we fight hurt in that space? Developing secure development, uh, DevSecOps at the tactical edge, pushing that down to the tactical edge is some of the work that we're doing. Um, but again, also thinking about how do we use Intel to support everything, which is really, really new, right? How do we use our organic intelligence to drive where we prioritize resources and where we see the adversary? So it's about a, both, both a resourcing conversation from a Title X man trained and equipped to enable us to look long, but it's also a how does Intel support the fight now to be able to prioritize the things that we know that the adversary is really focused on so we can get after those things. Um, I think, you know, collectively across the department, there's good, work, there's good work going on, but I think we all know there's still more battles to be won, uh, there's still more dragons to slay, and there's, there's just, just a ton more to do. I think this will be a good way to end, end things here, and uh, obviously Boston is in the house because the question is, what are the really wicked problems <laughs> Uh, the experts that we have here in the room should be trying to solve? Well, again, uh, you've heard uh, my concern about the democratization of the technologies. It's moving really fast, and it's good that our nation is really poised to um, capture and use the technology uh, in the positive ways. What we need your help to do is to look at how do we do that and how do we protect our citizenry as they, they, um, they, they use the technology to our benefits, right? So somebody has to look at the dark side of the technology and we, uh, that's the work we're asking you to do, right? Um, as you think about chat, GPT and AI, what does that mean for cybersecurity, right? We need you to think about that. Some of the things that we're doing, we're talking about how do we in integrate data across multiple systems to be able to deliver the joint all domain con command and control, right? As we build um, networks and systems, it's we're doing API calls that are going to be moving data from one system to the other. Um, how do we do that securely? We've got to think about data security. We've got to think about integrity. How do we, um, you know, what are the constructs to help us do that? Uh, and so those are the, those are really important for us from a warfighting perspective, but also. It's, I'll go back to, 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 the, to the point that how do we equip our young men and women that are our future leaders to understand how they navigate in this space, to make them conversant on this, this space that, you know, that what resonated with me was this idea that, you know, you don't give your child, um, you know, you teach them how to cross the road. You don't put them behind the wheel of a car either uh, without teaching them how to drive. And this thing, this tool uh, of the technology tools are powerful, um, but we've got to do a better job at starting at K, you know, at the lowest level before we put that toddler in front of a tablet to help them navigate um, uh, in this environment. So uh, it is, there's a military component, but there's also a citizenry component and that we really, really need to work hard to get after that. Great. General Malak, thank you for being here and for sharing your Thanks, insights. Sir. Thanks for the and invite. And for continuing to serve our great country. Thank right. you very much. Thanks, sir. Thank you so much.